Hello everyone, this is Vince from uh, Bassendine Motorcycles and I was, uh, I'm making, doing a voiceover for this um, particular video because the video that I took, uh, I, a lot of the information I said was wrong on it and yes, can't find that. Um, uh, you can see that they've given me the barrel and I'm pointing to a, a fin that I've already, will you fuck off? Thank you. Yeah, I'm pointing to a fin that I've already repaired. You can see the first one I've already put a piece in and welded it in with the MIG. And um, that's quite clear to see in this still. Now, now in this next clip, you'll see that I've started to repair. I've done the first piece of the top fin. And I'm just waiting for, uh, waiting for everything to cool down a bit so that I can do the next fin, the next piece of the top fin. And I'm showing you how... I do it, I get a piece of another barrel and snap it off, and uh, an old scrap barrel. I snap off a piece of cast iron, and I, and then I just weld it in. And then once it's welded in, I can shape it and blend it all in so that it looks uh, pretty natural. Uh, obviously, the, the stuff I'm welding in will be of higher quality than the, um, 19th and pre-World War One cast iron, which causes a few problems because it, it is very, um, has a lot of pockets of carbon and things like that in it, which it, which isn't great. But, um, I mean, it is doable. They will sometimes crack. Uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a hairline crack in them, but that's not the end of the world. I mean, if they fall out, we can obviously do it again. And it, it sometimes happens like that. Okay, now I'm showing you the valve gear, and this was where the main part of the work uh, happened. Uh, you've got the caps, you've got the um, the valves, the guides, the springs, the keepers, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, I had to um, replace the valves and the guides, which are very loose, and they look like they've been made of steel. Um, I'm not sure what they were actually made of in the first place. Uh, I was lucky to get some good material, some bronze to make them out of. Uh, I made new ones that's, and they screwed into the bottom of the uh, barrel. Um, here we're still fighting around with the, uh, with the fins. Now here's the finished result. The fins have been repaired. I've uh, cleaned them all up and painted them, painted the barrel itself. I'm obviously waffling on here about something, but you can see down in those, uh, holes in the top there's some tape which uh i've just used to um uh, tape off the uh the holes of the um, valve seats now we had to go down into these holes and um bore them and put hardened valve seats in uh, it's a common practice uh if you uh, know anything about cars or motorbikes or engines of any kind They've generally got hardened seats that go into the uh, cast iron. Here's a picture here that illustrates it. Uh, the dark piece you see here at the bottom of the port is actually a, a sintered steel um, or, or bronze valve seat. It's pressed into the head and uh, the, the valve itself comes down to seat on it. So this is months later. I've made my little uh, guides. Here's a hairy bloke sitting down to explain it all to you, but you can't hear his voice. The um, the golden looking parts are the guides that I made and screwed into the heads. They were made from scratch out of P2 bronze. A, it's an aluminium bronze and, a and it's got quite a lot of structural strength and it will still self lubricate. Uh, I'm just showing you, I'm um, pointing out the salient points of my wonderful work here where I put the uh, fins on, uh, wank, wank, wank. And um, definitely you can see the new Ferrera valves. No difference in the size of the valves, by the way, which is really weird on a modern motor because nearly always the inlet will be bigger than the exhaust. Not on this motor, it was very, very early on and they just put what they had. They ha would have one valve for the motor and that's what they'd use in both positions. So uh, there's that. The seats have been put in 
uh, the wonderful player Ray Abbott and his son Jace did that for me. Uh, I'm holding on to the inlet tube and that's what the carburetor goes on. Uh, I've turned it around now so you can see the the um, blank valves which haven't been trimmed yet and uh, the the guides, the springs, the keepers and the, the they haven't, haven't got collops, uh, collops, they've got this washer and then they've got these flat plates with a slight um, notch in them and you cut a two mil slot in the valve you compress the springs and push this little thing through and you could actually compress those springs with your fingers they were that weak and that's generally the case with uh, most of these early motors they did it so that you didn't pull the heads off the valves because the valves weren't made out of anything particularly great um, in the day whereas those valves are racing components <laughs> that you can buy, you buy them blank now and you cut them to whatever you want. But they are very good. The only thing with those valves, uh, the blank valves, is that they're soft on the ends. Now, softer than the rest of the valve. I'm not talking about soft, soft. I'm talking about they're soft for steel. So, uh, and you, I put little caps on them in the end and you'll see them later in the video. Um, yeah, I'm explaining how uh, I left the centers of these uh, bronze guides I left them at about 5 mil or 6 mil I think and these they were drilled to 6 mil and the valve guides at uh, the valve stems are 8 mil so he had plenty of um, space to center everything and then drill them through and ream them to the exact right size and they came out really nice actually so yeah everything came in from the top you had to go in through those holes. Very fiddly work. Hard to see what you're doing. So they he had to bore them first, then um, and then fit the guides. Uh, fit the um, the guides were in there originally. So you would have had to center everything, bore the guide, bore the valve seat, fit the valve seat, cut the valve seat, and put the valves in on top to make sure that they were seating properly. Yes. You can see here the um, keepers and the springs clearly. They're the originals, that those um, washers and springs and all that are the original stuff. They measured the compressed width I measured before I took all the old stuff apart so that uh, I knew the compressed height of the springs and that sort of thing because the, the less height there is. You can see I'm opening and closing those with my fingers, which is pretty funny because you never do that with a modern motor. Um, now I'm scratching my head thinking of something to say. As you can see, the ball looks pretty good. You can see a bit of it there. It is really very good. I, I, it had less than 3,000 miles on it, I think, this motor. And in 100 years, 110 years, that's pretty amazing. It must have uh, been stored very, very well, is all I can say. So, yeah, the bike that this, this motor was made in uh, uh, Switzerland and uh, would have been a proprietary motor that was bought in and it was put in a bike that was made in a Sydney bicycle factory called an Acme. Uh, the bike was an Australian made bike called an Acme and it had this Swiss motor in it. Now for me to go any further with this job, I need the, uh, I obviously need the case and the cams so that I can work out exactly where everything engages and so I can trim these valves and put caps on them and leave myself enough room for the adjusters to work that sort of thing. You'll notice a few jump cuts from here on in. Um, I'm still talking about the valve guides because I'm so proud of them. Uh, everything's coated in this waxy sort of uh, coating called soft seal that you can buy. You spray it on like a spray paint almost. Um, uh, there are the valves again from the top. Um, and now I'm going to show you the caps that screw on over the valves. Now they're there just for valve maintenance. Often those um, caps used to have uh, cooling fins on them. They were tall, sort of an arrangement, and they had cooling fins on them just to take some heat out of the motor because side valves are notorious for trapping heat, and uh, that was uh, one of the problems with them. They are... There's the two. Now, you'd probably think that uh, the spark plug would go in the middle uh, that black uh, hole in the middle of the cylinder, that one there. Um, no, it doesn't. That's actually a decompressor of some kind 
or a place you can put in some petrol to start it or, or something like that. I'm not sure what it was for, but probably a decompressor. Now, um, the spark plug went into that hole that I'm indicating there, the inlet valve cover. And uh, like I said, the yellow one either would have had a decompressor in it of some kind or it would have had a uh, cooling tree which screwed in on the top, which I'm sort of uh, describing there with my fingers. It looked like a little Christmas tree sort of a shaped affair which had cooling fins on it and it used to just suck heat away from that spot. Now we see a very hairy man. And what he's going to do is explain to us how early bikes, uh, the drive systems on early bikes worked. He's got a book, which you can't really see all that well, and he's going to point out some salient features of early drive systems on motorcycles. Now, the belt, uh, there was a flat belt uh, that uh, most bikes used at that time before World War I. Uh, that pictures of a, a very early Harley, probably the second iteration of, of the Harley motorcycle. You can see the giant pulley on the back wheel, the belt coming forward. It had standard bicycle gear on one side, which would have probably had a coaster brake, um, like on a normal sink fixed gear bicycle. Um, and on the other side, it had this giant belt. You can see it there uh, with a pulley on the motor, a pulley on the back wheel, and a tensioner pulley. And that was the clutch. You can see the little tensioner pulley there going up to the lever on the, and you basically pull the lever, it tightened the belt up and off you went. That's not how you started the bike. How you started the bike was you put it onto the rear stand, which that bike is already on its rear stand, and you pedaled it very fast and then pulled the clutch in, which turned the motor over, which would eventually make it start. And then once it was started, you'd release the clutch again, pull it off the stand, Hike your stand up under your back wheel, back uh, mudguard there so it stayed in place. And uh, off you went using the belt as a clutch. Now, they weren't, they were very primitive motors, so you had to rev them up a bit to get them going, get the bike going with your weight on it. Um, and it's a bit like riding a bicycle with a stationary motor in it, they are uncomfortable things to ride. They're, not very, they're smooth once they're going. I'll say that. They're smooth once they're going. But they, they didn't have really anything in the way of suspension and um, except for the air in the tyres. That was the only real suspension that they had and it made them very difficult. Now, here's the, I got, eventually got the case off the owner, one side of it, with the, uh, with the cams. And you can see here, or I, if I stop shaking the camera around, You'll see where I've um, I've got my little caps for the ends of the 8 mil valves. I've uh, glued them on with Loctite and uh, tightened them up there so that uh, tightened up the adjusters so that they um, set properly. And I'm very proudly displaying my work here. It it um, it's a good system. It looks like it's going to be probably a lot more reliable than the old system. And the old valves, which weren't original anyway, and had been replaced at some point. So, um, yeah, you, I mean, there's a, there's a million ways for this to fall apart, obviously. The, um, the barrel's very thin around the flange at the bottom, uh, so the barrel could just break off or anything like that. But uh, I, what I didn't, what I was very careful to do was not to put extra load on any of the parts. So I kept the original springs instead of putting something stronger in there, which would have helped the bike make more power. But that's not really the point of a bike like this. The point of a bike like this is to keep it alive. And if, to do that, I just left everything as standard. Also, heavier springs would have worn out the cams quicker. It would have caused a lot of problems. It wouldn't have caused any problems with the seats or valves because they were okay. They knew new components and they could take it. And a lot of these improvements that we've done with just metallurgy. Now you can see the uh, plate there, Fritz Moser, St. Auburn, Swiss. So that's obviously where the motors were made. The owner of this bike tracked down the son of the, or the grandson of the guy who made these. And um, he's kept all the files. And you can see that they did a lovely job of just um, uh, brush decorating the, uh, the aluminium on the cases, which is so nice. He didn't restore any of that. That's just as it was, which is incredible. Your lovely cast iron um, 
case for the timing case here with all the beautiful little gears in it. Uh, both the, they had separate cams, obviously, with gear and they were geared together. Um, other than that, that's all I got of the motor. Uh, it obviously went up here to some kind of generator. It wouldn't have been a generator. It would have been a magneto, actually. Uh, this early, it would, probably would have had carbide lights, um, which you would, yeah, um, yeah, which were carbide and acetylene. So they, they ran with carbide and acetylene. Now I'm explaining the lubrication system. Okay, now these motors uh, didn't have a sump or an oil tank, an uh, 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 oil bath in the motor. What would happen is those two ports, ports that I was pointing to, uh, there would be an oil tank next to the fuel tank, and I'm just showing you here. Yeah, the, and then and then there'd be a little pump. I'm just pointing to it here. Oh, you can't re there that little pump. And as you rode along, you would literally just pump oil into the motor every couple of miles or whatever it is, every mile or so. You'd give that a pump, and it would pump oil into the motor. And when it started to feel it tight or whatever, you <laughs> I don't know how it worked really because I've never done many miles on these sorts of bikes. But yeah, there they are. That's where it entered the motor. There was one went into the cam box and actually lubricated that. And there was one that went into the crankcase and just kept everything wet. And at the end of the ride, you'd open this little valve at the bottom and that would just dump the oil out of the motor. It's what's called a total loss lubrication system. And um, they don't exist anymore, thankfully. Everything's sealed. But yeah, they were messy things. And also this uh, part of the, all that open valve gear that you can see that I replaced on it, you'd have to stop every however many miles, uh, six to eight miles, I'd say, and just uh, get an oil can and give them a squirt just to make sure they're all right. But I told this owner that, that if he used something like Maury's val uh, Valve Saver, which is a, a lubricant that you put in your oil, as a top cylinder lubricant, it would run down the guides and actually lubricate them and he wouldn't have to do that. Back then they didn't have things like that. I mean, they had castor oil and, and stuff like that that they could put in and that would probably make a big difference. But it's a vegetable oil, uh, castor oil, so I'm not sure how much good it really would have done. Um, yeah, they could have actually run it. And it's similar to running, similar to the way that a two-stroke lubricates itself, but. Um, and like I said to him, it'll probably smoke a bit at idle, but uh, you'll save all your valve gear, and um, but you'll still have to pump oil into your into your cases and whatever. But yeah, the, the, whatever you pumped into your crankcase would hit the crank and get flicked up into the bores, and that's that's very important. So, so there'd probably be some sort of a drip feed, and then when you were doing heavy duty sort of work, you'd you'd pump the pump, right? And and that's it was a manual oil pump. Literally, it wasn't driven by the motor at all. So, and there it is, the lovely little 1911 Moses. So rare to ever get to work on anything pre World War One. It's so exciting. Uh, I have touched some stuff before that was uh, World War One, but I never did much work on it. Just got my hands on it, you know. Um, definitely very exciting. And we'll see you later. <laughs>